So Maureen Haberlandis is the Career Services Consultant in the Center for Career Opportunities here at Purdue University. Maureen is an innovative professional with 30 years experience in higher education with a focus on career counseling and development. After earning a Bachelor's of Arts in English from the University of Notre Dame and teaching high school English, Maureen obtained her Master's of Education, Master of Science in Education in College Student Professional uh, Administration from Indiana University, where she focused on career development and counseling. Throughout her professional life in higher education, Maureen has had wonderful experiences and opportunities to work with diverse people and organizations. She has served with seven institutions, in IU, DePaul University, uh, St. Norbert uh, College, Purdue's Cranet School of Management and its sister program, ISMA, in Hanover, Germany, uh, Purdue Alumni Association, and now Purdue Center for Career Opportunities. She has guided the career development of undergraduates, graduate students, executives, alumni, and international and domestic students representing numerous degree programs. She has taught Management 295, Professional Career Management, a course she redeveloped as an impact course, and EDPS 315, Collaborative Leadership, Interpersonal Skills. So very fitting to today's topic. She has also presented twice at a conference in Beijing, China, on the role of career development in the United States. She's also participated as a member, conference presenter, and leader with numerous professional organizations on campus, regionally and nationwide. She also loves being part of the campus life, interacting with students, and guiding the professional development. She's originally from Michigan, and Maureen lives here in Lafayette with her husband, Kyle, and enjoys time spent with family, friends, neighbors, dog, and neighbors' dogs, traveling, and attending community events. So without further ado, please welcome Maureen Hervantes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eileen and Stephanie, for having me here. Uh, this evening. I'm so happy to be able to, to work with you. And when I say work with you, yes, we're going to put that collaboration into play because we're going to work together. I'm actually going to expect that we have participation. All right, so where we're going to start today is with this video. This is going to be the story of the geese. All of you have seen birds, ducks, geese, flying around in the sky, and especially at this time of year, you'll see them because many of them are now migrating. And you'll see them in a particular formation style, and there's a very particular reason why they are in this formation style. It has to do with collaboration. It has to do with them understanding the culture of their organization. So I'm going to have Eileen play the video. Lessons from the geese. In the fall, we can see geese heading south for the winter. Geese always fly along in V formation. This is what science has discovered about why geese fly that way. As each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird right behind it. By flying in V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew on its own. When one goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of trying to fly alone. It quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird in front. When the head goose gets tired, it rotates back to another position in the wing. When that happens, another goose flies point. Geese honk from behind and encourage those up front to keep up their speed. Finally, and this is very important, when a goose gets sick or is hurt, it falls out of formation. Two other geese then fall out with that hurt goose and follow it down to lend help and protection. They stay with the fallen goose until it is able to fly or until it dies. Only then do the two helping geese launch out on their own to catch up with their group. So, take a look at your sheet. We just had the story of the geese and you happen to see exactly what happened. We're going to go to this next area, and now I want to start getting a little bit of conversation about what do these areas mean, and also how do we see them within this particular video. And so I'm actually going to stand over here a little bit so I can read this a little bit better than I can uh, with my back to the screen up here. So, helping others and working together. What did you see in that video that talked about the geese that would indicate that they actually have a collaborative style, they can um, react to each other one-to-one, one-to-a-group, so very interpersonally, 
in a focused way, and then also they have a certain knowledge of their community. They know the expectations. They know how the systems work and what's expected of them. So if we just take the first one, helping others and working together, how is it that those geese did that? So we happen to have that idea of helping others and working together, and why is that effective in the case of these geese? We have another one we're going to look at here. This is organizational behavior and teamwork. And we know, it says here, and navigating is kind of important given that we're talking about these geese, but it's understanding the group development, how it navigates its situations, mitigating anything that happens, working through it, and then also uh, responding to the behaviors of the others in order to enhance again, what the group is trying to accomplish. How did you see that here? And you might, in fact, use some of the same responses or similar, maybe with a twist or so. So how did you see their organizational behavior and teamwork working to the betterment of them, particularly if you focus on that group development, the anticipation of what might happen, what they needed to navigate, any issues that they had to mitigate, any problems, and responding to behaviors. Service and social responsibility. You actually already mentioned this, and it went in with what just occurred, that they have a social responsibility to each other to number one, stay with the team, fill in when someone gets tired, but also to make sure that if someone does become ill, needs to go and rest up, whatever the issue might be, that goose is not alone. So they understand, and that's a part of the culture. And so a really nice part of the culture. Here you happen to have, and how many of you used to play with boxes, and maybe still do? All right, what, what did you do with those boxes? What were some of the things you created? Here is the story, and then we're going to talk about those particular essential skills within collaboration. During one of my summers between probably sophomore year and junior year in college, maybe first and second year, I served as a camp counselor at a camp for children with special needs. At that camp, we were all assigned a group of children. And these children, I believe, were about ages five through seven. So get that age group in your head. Know what we're working with here. And then they had various special needs. All right, well, one of the activities as we worked with our teams was to come together as a whole group, still in our teams, we were given refrigerator boxes and various supplies. Supplies such as scissors and crayons and markers and tape and other things because each group was to create a carnival game so that when we were done creating our carnival game, then each of the teams would go around and play the carnival teams. However, they were going to be divided into, I think it was possibly three different sections so that two sections would remain at their carnival games to run the games and then the others would go around, visit them, and then they'd switch and then two more would stay, that other one would go around and enjoy the carnival games, etc. So here I have my group of campers and they were really a lot of fun. And as we approached this box, I was thinking, oh gosh, what are we going to develop as a game? And you could see this going any number of ways. And so I brainstormed with them um, as much as you can often do with a five to seven year old child. And we came up with different ideas. I prompted them with some ideas. And then we got to decorating our box. Now, I wanted these campers to continue to develop a team spirit. And so I noticed that I look, as I looked around, some of the other adults were actually starting to do the work on the refrigerator boxes and telling the children what to do. And I'm not saying that that wasn't a good approach, but I'm going to tell you my approach. My approach was 
you know, I love stuff like this, and I would have so much fun creating our carnival game because I'm somewhat artistic and I like to build things. But I figured these kids would really enjoy calling it their own, and it really didn't matter if it was what we might consider a higher piece of art, or if it might actually look like something, perhaps, and some of you might be Picasso enthusiasts, but it might look a little bit discombobulated, and that would be okay. So I let them create their refrigerator box carnival game. The only thing that I really insisted upon was, as these are five to seven year olds, is I was in charge of the box cutter and the scissors. There was no way I was going to let them take care of that. So they created everything. They, their artwork was all over the place. And if someone were to come in from outside, they might even look at it and say, wow, that's rather juvenile or rudimentary. Well, in fact, it was because they're juveniles, right? So it, it was their work. It didn't look as snazzy as some of the other things. But this is what happened. When it was time, for the groups to start exchanging and going around to visit the other carnival games, this group of children did not want to leave their carnival game. They were so proud of it that they wanted to stay there and represent it. They just wanted to play their own game. Now, recognizing that this was meant to be a full participation, we had to think of a way, what do I do with these little kids to get them to also participate in the whole? And so what we did is we divided this little group into subgroups to say, okay, you don't have to be up there a whole lot of time, but, but you need to enjoy other people's things too. And so they went off, some stayed, they came back, some stayed, they came back, etc. So. Let's talk about this group with respect to some of these points. And so there are some pictures of kids. So, cultural intelligence and inclusion. So, understanding diverse perspectives, backgrounds, beliefs, cultures, experiences, historical dynamics can influence a group um, and also enhance a group potentially. It can also foster an environment in which people feel welcomed, valued, free to share viewpoints, contribute to a cause, create that sense of belonging. With that story that I shared with you, where do you see that demonstrated in that real life experience that I had? Diverse perspectives. What was it about these children that potentially forced me or encouraged me to to do something specific. What allowed them to feel that they belonged? Helping others and working together. Some of this might already uh, have been expressed, basically, but helping others and working together. We certainly saw within this group that they did help each other. They shared markers and crayons. They gave each other feedback. organizational behavior and teamwork and so the group they had so there was some anticipation going on I had to anticipate what issues might come up with this group now one thing I did not anticipate was I didn't know that they wouldn't want to leave their carnival game so that was something that we had to work through so that was something we had to mitigate so we had to work through that um, I had to navigate that with them to help them understand the value and how much fun it would be to actually go out and see some of the other games too and be a part of that larger community. And enhancing the group's efficiency and effectiveness, we had a limited time. Certainly by me taking care of the scissors, that helped the effectiveness. Um, but they worked on different panels basically as they saw fit and so we simply worked the way it was that they distributed themselves but service and social responsibilities what do you see in that example that would show that there was a sense of service that needed to be acknowledged and social responsibility that needed to be acknowledged to make this work what about 
about um, responsible decision-making, ethical actions, and meaningful service enhances social welfare. What was going on, perhaps, with social welfare in that? So they learned how to depend upon each other as a team. They learned to enjoy each other and to work together in the way that they work together as five to seven-year-olds, which can be quite interesting at times. OK, so um, as mentioned, I happen to instruct a class management 295, professional career management in Cranert. With this experience, I went into that experience in 2013. I moved over from the MBA side of the Professional Development Center in Craner to the undergrad side, and I took over the, the career development piece, and my partner, Eric, he kept the employer development piece. As one of my positions, I actually took over the class from him, and I took it through a program here on campus to have the class highly interactive. It's called IMPACT, which was to take a class and make it much more student-centered instead of a professor just standing and lecturing the whole time and, and you just look at slides all the time. Okay, so I inherited first a group of graduate students, first and second year grad students, and there was a whole culture that had been built, and it took a lot of time. Um, I left my position there in 2017, um, took a lot of time to kind of get the culture the way I was hoping it would be and the way that I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing when you're able to lead a group and have it turn out this way. So what happened is I had six graduate students assigned to me. There were three second years, three first years. So we already had some mentoring going on, some carryover. I also had about 280 some students um, in the course. I had divided that into four different sections, and in those sections I divided them into 12 tables. So each table had about six students at it. So four sections, 12 tables, 12 teams in each section, and my GAs, they then were responsible for certain groups, and they all have the same number of students for which they were responsible. In order to make this a really interactive class and learn about professional development, we had a lot of activities. And I wanted those students to come into career services at least once. Well, guess what? They came into career services usually five to six times during the semester because they were interacting with their graduate assistant who became their guide, their Sherpa. And that graduate assistant was was walking through exercises with them, specifically doing their elevator pitches with them, working with mock interview programs and other exercises they, that they were doing, providing all that great feedback. Every week, for the most part, myself, my associate, my assistant director, and my six GAs would get together and we would have a meeting about our class. Now my assistant director and I, we were the ones in the classroom because the MBA students, their classes couldn't allow them to be in our classes at the same time. So we had meetings and during those meetings, one of the things that I started doing by the time I got to these groups out here was, I, I always said, you know, all the voices here are valuable and so I want you to provide feedback. What ideas do you have? How can we make the course better? How did that exercise go? Is anyone having any issues with any of the students on your teams, etc.? And what happened was these graduate students took such ownership of their teams because they were the lead for their teams. And many times during our meetings, even though I had the final say in something, and if there were issues or something, then I needed to be the one ultimately responsible for whatever happened. But it was wonderful because these GAs, they started coming up with all sorts of ideas, and we'd go with those ideas. Was everything exactly how I would do it? No, it was not. But we had a great experience, and what happened was these graduate students were supposed to work, um, I can't remember how many hours, if it was 10 or 20 each during the week. Well, they kept staying later and later. And they would say that they'd meet up with students outside of time. 
And I'd say, you know, you can't do that because you're being paid hourly, so you can't stay. But they'd say, but I want to. I want to help these students. They're my students. So there was a tremendous amount of ownership. So as we look at that experience, appropriate and productive relationships. So our concept here, our, um, excuse me, actually, our interactions, interactions, relations, and exchanges based on suitable for the context. So we knew we were working with college undergraduates. We knew that we needed to have standards for grading, that it needed to be fair across the board. We had all these things we had to follow. That was enforced. It was, we were a full team on that. But then we also had a lot of connections within that group. We had connections with the students. We had connections with employers who then worked with the students. And there was this constant um, synergistic relationship going on. Cultural intelligence and inclusion. I had to understand that this group of graduate students, they wanted to be involved. They just didn't want to do something and say, great, it's paying my tuition. They wanted to be invested. And in order to invest them, I had to let them own this, which they did. It was so amazing. We had a great time. Also, we had to understand the diverse perspectives with them, but then also with the teams. So you know the students here at Purdue, many of them are, you know, we in some ways have a very diverse community. Well, we saw that in the classroom. We saw that in the teams. Sharing those viewpoints. And in our meetings, they always knew that they could share their viewpoints. Sometimes I'd agree. Sometimes they'd agree. Sometimes we'd disagree. Sometimes they'd disagree with each other. It didn't matter. The purpose was we had an open dialogue. And then we came up with the best solution. Helping others and working together, we certainly did that as a team. And in fact, that also was a part of the process in the class. They helped each other on different projects. They gave each other feedback. We talked in large group, small group, to get different perspectives on the various issues um, that came up in class. Organizational behavior and teamwork. So again, they actually had to work on some projects and they had to anticipate what might happen. They had to do some problem solving. They came up with some problems at times that they then had to figure out to mitigate as they interacted with alumni, as they inter interacted with um, their employer groups. And then service and social responsibility. We knew that we owed it to them to give them a great educational experience and we needed to do that in a just and fair way. We needed to be consistent. That didn't mean that sometimes someone had a special issue that needed to be addressed in a different way. But overall, we were pretty consistent, and people could trust that in us. And so, as we end, these are some things that you might find an interest in. There is a, a thing called a Mind Tools. And you can go to Mind Tools, and you can get ideas about different issues, including um, active listening, which is part of being in a collaborative environment. Recognize that systems do exist and that one action can impact the whole. Learn to apologize when needed. Some people will not apologize. I have, had, I have worked with people, I have had bosses who they will not apologize. I've apologized many times to people with whom I have worked including people who have been, uh, who have worked, you might say, for me. Um, and that's an okay thing. It's okay to be human, and it's okay to admit that you're not always right, and that someone else can come up with a good idea. But also you can, you can have them help you do things better. And I always told my staff, let me know if there is something that I've done or that I'm not doing that I could be doing better, because I want to improve. That also builds trust. Um, there you go, create clarity, set goals, have people actually know what you're working towards, and then share the power where appropriate. You don't have to give them all the scissors and the box cutters, but what you can give them, let them go at it, let them feel invested. 